When the United States entered the war and assumed this major role on the Western Front, American methods of dealing with war news began to intrude on the romantic attitude that had so colored war reporting uh, in the desert. Public relations, of which war correspondents were considered a part, became another cog in the massive military machine the Americans constructed to defeat Hitler. <clears throat> The Supreme Commander, General Eisenhower, spelt it out very clearly. Public opinion wins war, he told a meeting of American newspaper editors. I have always considered uh, as quasi-staff officers correspondents accredited to my headquarters. So, beginning with the invasion of North Africa, the Allied system for controlling war correspondents grew steadily through the Italian campaign by D-Day and Normandy battle. It was as much a part of military planning as, say, logistics was. Considerable resources were devoted to it. By late 1944, the Allied Public Relations headquarters in Paris had the staff and facilities to deal each week with three million words from nearly 1,000 correspondents plus 35,000 photographs and 100,000 feet of newsreel film. A more easily understandable example is that the U.S. 9th Army, which at San Antonio used to see about two journalists a week, only if we called them up, found on arrival in France that it was required to provide accommodations and mess facilities for 50 correspondents, a mobile radio link capable of transmitting a voice to London, a teletype circuit, and technicians to run it, plus 50 vehicles and drivers. Generals became conscious of the importance of projecting a good image of knowing what the correspondents wanted and being able to give it to them. The U.S. 9th Air Force organized an expedition of correspondents to tour the front lines to get a commander's view on tactical air support. The program included a briefing by Generals Omar Bradley, George S. Patton, Courtney Hodges, and William H. Simpson. Simpson arranged for his public relations men to have on hand a sergeant fresh from the field. Bring him in mud, beard and all, Simpson ordered. Don't clean him up. Simpson's made a few Simpson made a few opening remarks to the correspondents and then said that an ordinary soldier who had sneaked, crawled, and run forward behind Allied skip bombing and strafing would better be able to describe the fine quality of tactical air support. He then dramatically produced the muddy sergeant who was seized by the correspondents and featured heavily in their stories. True, censorship remained. But it is the opinion of at least one noted correspondent of the Second World War that censorship enabled correspondents to be better informed about the war than, say, their colleagues in Vietnam would be late 20 years later. Drew Middleton writes, quote, As long as all copy was submitted to censors before transmission, people in the field, from generals down, felt free to discuss top secret material with reporters. On three trips to Vietnam, I found generals and everyone else far more wary of talking to reporters precisely because there was no censorship. So we have strong evidence that the military came to consider correspondence as part of the forces, and it is equally clear that many correspondents felt the same way. Earlier in the war, it had been thought that correspondents, as unarmed non-combatants, were ineligible for decorations. Then General MacArthur broke American Army precedent by awarding the Silver Star to Vernon Hoffland of the AP for, quote, devotion to duty and fortitude, end quote. Harry Gorrell, Jr. of the United Press was awarded the Air Medal for giving first aid to a wounded air gunner during a bombing raid on Greece. Leo S. Disher of the United Press got a Purple Heart after the attack on Oren, and at least five British correspondents were mentioned in dispatches for conduct under fire. Moorhead, Monson, Clifford, Basil Gingell, 
of the Exchange Telegraph and Ciro Ray of the BBC. Ray, who had been, quote, almost a conscientious objector, end quote, early on, but then found, to his horror, that, quote, I came to adore the whole business and had a wonderful time, end quote, got his mention in dispatches at Ortona in Italy for grabbing a gun and leading the sa to safety a platoon of Canadians that had lost all its officers and NCOs. Quote, I like to think that I managed it without killing any Germans. End quote. Some correspondents began to carry guns, and the American and British armies seemed to be preceded at times by jeep loads of journalists who frequently found themselves taking towns and accepting surrenders. Ernest Hemingway, whose style of war reporting was to take part in the action as if he were an infantry officer and then to write about what had happened to him, reported that he had managed to gather a small combat outfit of his own, mostly French irregulars, and get into Paris in almost a day before the official liberation. Evelyn Irons of the Evening Standard accredited to the Free French Army because Montgomery at first uh, refused to have any women correspondents with the British forces, captured a village in Bavaria. Quote, we somehow had gotten ahead of the advance, and four of us in a jeep came to this village and found no Allied troops had arrived. So we took it ourselves. We were armed. The French would have none of this nonsense about war correspondents not carrying weapons. So we held up everyone at gunpoint and accepted their surrender. Then we helped ourselves to all the radios, cameras, and binoculars we could find and drove off." Unquote. Marguerite Higgins of the New York Herald Tribune liberated prisoners at Dachau concentration camp. Kemsley correspondent Leonard Mosley parachuted behind German lines. Ronald Monson became so angry after seeing Belsen concentration camp that, as he said, quote, I drove my car into a column of German prisoners. My God, did they scream, end quote. So, for bravery and endurance, basically bearing in mind that none of them had to be there, war correspondents emerged with the distinction. But what we are concerned with here is not their courage, but the quality of their reporting. It is worth reading the view of a war correspondent himself, Reginald Thompson, a captain of the British Intelligence Corps, until he was released in late July 1944 to be a war correspondent for the Sunday Times. He afterward became a military historian of some renown. In 1969, he looked back at the Allied campaign in Europe in a book, Montgomery the Field Marshal. Thompson concluded, quote, in the nature of things it was difficult, if not impossible, for any man on the spot to write a balanced account of events as they were taking place. Some saw, others listened, and often the events men did not match the things to which men listened. Inevitably, prejudices were fed, and I believe that it was impossible for a general reader of a newspaper to form a balanced view of the progress of the war." End quote. Or, as Thompson put it more succinctly to the author, I'm certain that readers of the Times in 1854 had a damned sight better view of the Crimean War than readers of the Times in 1939-45 did of the Second World War. It is possible to illustrate this by taking some of the major stories of the war in Europe and seeing how correspondents handled them. We'll begin with the DP raid in August 1942, not because it was of any great military importance, one history gives it just six lines, but because it shows the lengths to which the military establishment went to conceal its failures and how correspondents became involved in this concealment. 6,000 troops, 5,000 Canadians and the rest made up of British commandos, a token force from the United States Rangers Battalion, and a few Frenchmen, raided Dieppe on 
August 9, 1942, for nine hours. What should have been a triumph for Canadian arms turned into a bloody massacre. British archive papers released in 1972 show that the Chief of Combined Operations, Lord Louis Mountbatten, told the War Cabinet uh, the day after the raid that it had gone off, quote, very satisfactorily, end quote. The planning had been excellent, air support faultless, naval losses extremely light. Of the 6,000 men involved, two-thirds had returned to Britain, and, quote, all I have seen are in great form, end quote. Throughout this exercise and self-congratulation, not a word was mentioned about the crippling Canadian losses. How was Mountbatten to, able to get away with describing DP in terms appropriate to the playing fields when it would have been more accurate to rank it with the charge of the Light Brigade? The official communiques had been remarkable for confusion and contradiction, unable to state definitely the proportion of Canadians taking part. Confusion may have been deliberate, because the records show that the Ministry of Information was making an intensive effort to conceal from the public the extent of the disaster. The United States Army carefully worded communiques gave the impression that the Rangers had carefully had dominated the raid and that the way back to Europe had been opened by American servicemen, a headline snapped up by American newspapers. We land in France, said the New York Post. Tanks and U.S. troops smashed to the French coast, said the New York World Telegram. Nine correspondents went on the DP raid. Four were American, three Canadian, and two British. At the pre-raid briefings, they had been told that, quote, as representatives of a free press, end quote, they could report events as they saw them, quote, honestly and fearlessly within the limitations permitted by considerations of security, end quote. A.B. Austin of the Daily Herald, who was later killed in the fighting in Italy, covered for the entire London press on pool bases. Austin wrote the, an eyewitness report of the British commandos in action. It was a graphic, if bloodthirsty, description of one part of the operation, but it made no mention of the level of casualties and no mention of the Canadian forces, and it gave no indication whatsoever of the success or failure of the mission as a whole. Ross Monroe, reporting for the Canadian Press News Agency, was in a boat in which casualties reached 80%, so he had some idea of the extent of the slaughter. He opened his story with, quote, for eight raging hours under intense Nazi fire, from dawn into a sweltering afternoon, I watched Canadian troops fight the blazing, bloody battle of the DP. End quote. He mentions later that, quote, the fire was murderous, end quote, and that the Canadians' firepower was reduced by casualties, but the overall impression he gave is that the raid was a success. Drew Middleton, one of the American correspondents on the raid, makes the point that the correspondents did not have access to any casualty figures, but claims that none of his readers could have missed in his story that casualties were heavy and the raid a failure. In fairness, it must be emphasized that the correspondents were laboring under double censorship combined operations first, and then the ordinary censor. This plus the fact of that Lord Mountbatten insisted that no copy could be cleared until the correspondents had first been given a thorough briefing, meant that the first messages were not sent off until nearly 30 hours after the operation, and were written by men verging on a total exhaustion. Monroe kept going on Benzedrine tablets, but the reason he was unable to tell the story of the whole tragic mess at DEP is more complicated and lies closer to the core of the problem than confronted all the Second World War correspondents. Before becoming a correspondent, Monroe had joined the Canadian Army and been commissioned as a lieutenant in the Army Service Corps. Quote, I was committed uh, to the war 
completely and utterly, right from the start, end quote, he said later. Quote, I don't think p young people today could ever feel the commitment that we had. Maybe it was just jingoism, chauvinism, and stupidity, but we felt that the Germans were going to wreck the world of ours and that we would have to stop them. The troops were committed to it, and I think the correspondents were. I certainly was. But it won't ever happen again. The war that we were involved in was very clear-cut. It really was a crusade, end quote. In Britain, Monroe lived with the Canadian Army, went on training courses and maneuvers, and wrote a few lines about every Canadian soldier he met for the soldier's hometown paper. He thus acquired an intimate knowledge of the organization of the Army, and in turn was widely known to both Canadian soldiers and to their families back in Canada. In these circumstances, it would have been unrealistic to expect him to write the truth about DP at the time or later to write about an incident with the Canadian troops that shot eight German prisoners of war. At DEP, it was understandable that, instead, he chose to write about the valor of the troops. Quote, they must rank among Canada's immortals of the battlefields. End quote. Monroe agrees that the raid was an utter tactical failure, that practically everything now could have gone wrong uh, and that could have gone wrong did so that quote looking back it seems to me to have been an incredibly risky task with only a gambler's chance of success end quote but he <clears throat> even if he had wanted to write these lines immediately after the raid the censors would not have allowed it when you went abroad as a correspondent, you couldn't report all that you liked. You were up against censorship, and it was quite rigid. There was a reason for it, of course. If there was a bad action and half the battalion was shot up, it would be weeks before the impact was felt at home. So in a sense, the censor protected the public. I can see that now. But you get very deft and skilled at telling the story honestly and validly despite censorship. I never really felt, except maybe on the DEP raid, that I was really cheating the public at home. After the raid, Monroe was flown back to Canada and sent on a speaking tour of the seven cities that the DEP units represented. I felt then that what I had done had been more useful than if I had stayed as, on as a lieutenant in the Army Service Corps. I had probably achieved more for my country." End quote. In a way, Monroe was right. In a war which the wickedness of the enemy did not have to be invented, a patriotic war correspondent got on side. But this meant that the wartime reader had to learn to treat most correspondence dispatches like official communiques with some skepticism. So it turns out that the most accurate summary of the DEP at the time was actually a German one written by a PK man who had been visiting a nearby Luftwaffe station, appeared in the Deutsche Alignment Zipfang as executed, quote, uh, he wrote, the venture mocked all rules of military logic and strategy, end quote. The correspondent's commitment to what Steinbeck described as Quote, that huge and gassy thing called the war effort, end quote, is probably best illustrated by the Patton slapping incident. General George S. Patton, Jr., commander of the United States 7th Army, an unhappy combination of a brilliant tank general and a perennial adolescent known as, quote, old blood and guts, end quote, and given to wearing pearl-handled revolvers and a cowboy holster, was visiting a military hospital evacuation tent in Sicily early in August 1943. He came across a soldier who he suspected of feigning illness, and in front of the astonished doctors, he slapped the soldier on the face. This incident might have passed unrecorded, but five days later, in another hospital tent, 
Patton came upon another private and again asked the man what ailed him. When the private replied that he thought it must be his nerves, Patton lost control of himself. He called the man a coward, quote, a yellow bastard, end quote, slapped him across the face with a pair of yellow gloves, and when the soldier moved toward the door of the tent, kicked him in the behind. Patton then began to sob, and as he emerged from the tent, he was heard by a correspondent Noel Monks to shout, quote, There's no such thing as cell shock. It's an invention of the Jews, end quote. As it turned out, Patton had picked the wrong soldier. The man had fought throughout the Tunisian and Sicilian campaigns, and his record was excellent. His unit doctor had tried to get him to have treatment a week earlier, but the soldier had refused to leave the front and had continued to fight with his unit until finally he was ordered to the hospital. At the press camp, about 20 correspondents held a meeting and decided that no one would send a story about the incident. Instead, they appointed a courier to fly to Algiers with a petition to General Eisenhower, asking that he order Patton to apologize to the soldier. Eisenhower, who had, no doubt, received other reports of the incident, wrote to Patton denouncing his conduct and ordering him to apologize to the two men, to all witnesses of the incidents, and the officers and men of each of his divisions, or be removed from his command. Patton complied, and so the returning the whole story was known to thousands of soldiers, many of whom would be returning to the United States. Edward Kennedy, a senior Associated Press correspondent, asked to see Eisenhower, pointed this out to him, and expressed the view that, since the affair must eventually find its way into print, it would be preferable that war correspondents on the spot wrote it. Eisenhower told the correspondents that they were perfectly free to write the story if they wished to do so, but that he believed its publication would be of value to the enemy's propaganda and could embarrass the United States Army Command. This amounted to a personal request to Eis from Eisenhower to suppress the story, and that was what the correspondents on the spot did. For nearly three months, not a word was published about the incident, although it continued to be widely discussed throughout the United States Army. Then the Washington columnist Drew Pearson got to hear it. Pearson was not a war correspondent and was not subject to Army censorship. He submitted the story to the United States internal censors for their reaction. The censors checked with the War Department, which urged that the story be killed for reasons of morale. Internal censorship felt that its terms of reference did not allow it to act on these tenuous grounds, and it gave Pearson its approval to publish the story. So a major news story, it concerned whether or not Patton should be removed from his command, was broken not by a war correspondent, but by a columnist who knew news when he heard it. The reaction at Eisenhower's headquarters was one of confusion. At first, a blanket of censorship dropped over the case. Then an officer of Eisenhower's staff issued a statement, but told correspondents that they would be allowed to send only those facts contained in the statement. Finally, another officer announced that correspondents could br send anything on the matter that they knew to be true. Kennedy, who at least had the satisfaction of knowing that his advice to Eisenhower had been proven correct, got his story of the incident away from away on November 23rd. It was considered so important that, although months out of date, it still made headlines around the world, except perhaps in Britain, where the Times agreed with its correspondent at Allied headquarters in Algiers, Philip D. S. Ewer, and his assessment of the matter. In a small item given minor display and headed only an unfortunate incident, Ewer wrote that the United States Army's statement had now put the matter in proper perspective. He concluded with his own advice to Eisenhower, quote, General Patton is too great a commander to be anywhere but in the field of active service, end quote. <laughs>
The support for the military view of matters extended to most areas. When, at Monte Cassino, on February 15, 1944, the Allies bombed to pieces the 1,400-year-old monastery, parent house of the Benedictine Order, and one of the most picturesque monuments of Christian culture, they justified the act on the grounds of military necessity. The lives of soldiers mattered more than monasteries. A German PK reporter, writing for the Deutsche Allgemeine Allgemein Zeitung, wrote that the bombing was, quote, a devilish work of destruction without any military justification whatsoever. Who was right? Most Allied correspondents fell in step with the military argument. The bombing, they wrote, was justified as an act of war. Only Roman Catholic bombardiers, all volunteers, had taken part. And the building would be reconstructed when peace came. And it was. Christopher Buckley of the Daily Telegraph, who watched the bombers return a month later, and, in four hours of almost continuous action, wipe out the town of Casino as well, admitted that, quote, it was pretty easy, perhaps too easy, to feel compunction, end quote. But he simply reminded himself and his readers, who had started it all, quote, I was in Warsaw on September 1st, 1939, and I remember from the evidence of my own eyes who was responsible for letting loose this terrible weapon. End quote. Correspondents argue that even if they had wanted to challenge the official version of events, they were in no position to do so, because they were totally dependent on the military to be able to see the war at all. The arrangements for the press coverage of D-Day, for example, needed complete cooperation from the military, which treated correspondence as just another branch of the services. As part of a broad deception plan, it put them on a train to Scotland a month before the invasion and kept them there for a week. True, it then did everything it could to help them cover the landings, accredited to fewer than 558 writers, radio reporters, photographers, and cameramen, and providing censors on the assault craft, and even on the beaches. A military British officer tipped off Ross Monroe of the Canadian press about a destroyer going back to Britain from a Normandy beachhead to pick up General Montgomery, thus enabling Monroe to send back the first dispatch from the coast of France and maintain his record. The first eyewitness stories from Spitsbergen, DP, Sicily, and Italy. There were limited radio links, but there were courier planes, speedboats, and special facilities for those who had to stay in London, and as the invasion proceeded, the four correspondents with advance headquarters were given a lengthy briefing by Eisenhower himself. The correspondents sent some 700,000 words on the first day, and yet, reading their reports 30 years later, one cannot escape the impression of that the sheer size of the operation overwhelmed most of them. Radio emerges best, partly because, unlike the wartime newspapers with their restricted space, it could give a story as much time as was merited. The BBC assigned 48 correspondents for D-Day, including Chester Wilmot and a glider, Richard Dimbleby with R the RAF, Robert Dunnett with the United States Army, Stanley Maxted in the Minesweeper, and Robert Barr with General Eisenhower at SHAEF. But it was more, it was an Air Force observer, Air Commodore W. Helmore in a Mitchell, Recording for the BBC, under the stress of a bombing attack, the first eyewitness account of the Normandy invasion, who had listeners all over the world, silent by their radios, quote, 
This is history. It is a thing that I cannot be eloquent about in an aeroplane because I've got engine noises in my ears, but this is really a great moment for us. I feel detached in that awful feeling that the great history of the world is unfolding before us at this very moment. And at this very, at this very moment, that, too, was the feeling of George Hicks, of C.B., uh, end quote. That, too, was the feeling of George Hicks, CBS conveyed, broadcasting from an American naval ship in the channel. He was interrupted by static. The sound of the ship's whistle, explosions, heavy ek ek, cheery voices cheering, quote, terrible terrific background noises and his own excitement if you'll excuse me i'll just take a deep breath for the moment and stop speaking end quote for dramatic effect a, a sense of immediacy and the involvement of the listener hicks broadcast typifies the lead that radio maintained in its d-day reporting beside it the newspaper reporting appeared stilted and overly formal and even the soft pieces, articles that are not hard news but are expected to add to the reader's understanding of an event, to round out the picture, to help tell a fuller story, seemed for the most part unsatisfactory. Perhaps censorship was to blame. W.W. W. Chaplin of NBC wrote a bitter but illuminating description of General de Gaulle making a political speech in a little village in Normandy before an audience that included a peasant woman with a wheelbarrow holding the body of her child, killed by an Allied bombardment. The censor would not pass it. He wrote about a French town showered from the air with leaflets warning the inhabitants to leave because the Allies would have to shell and bomb the town. The wind carried the leaflets away, the people received no warning, and they died in the rubble of their houses. The censor killed the story. Perhaps what was needed was more correspondence of the caliber of A. J. Liebling of the New York of the New Yorker. Liebling's ability to seize on what appeared to others to be the commonplace and to fit this into its proper context in the war was not part of the equipment of many correspondents. An article he wrote for his magazine under the after the invasion with his descriptions of dead cows, quote, the stench of innocent death, end quote, a crutch in an abandoned farmyard, and the contents of a deserted house, old corsets, a marriage contract dated year three of the First Republic, dingy family photographs, a pile of exercise book, marked Cahir de Albert Hedwin, end quote, a bundle of letters from Louis Hedwin of the 336th Infantry beginning on September 25th, 1914, brought some idea of what it was like to be advancing with the Allies through Normandy in the summer of 1944. All of the New Yorker's reporting was excellent, but its audience infinitesimal. Its volume of war news reported represented less than 1% of the total reach in the United States, and its wartime circulation never exceeded 234,000. As the war moved closer to the German homeland, it was not only a question of correspondence being dependent on military. In many cases, it was a matter of correspondence becoming involved in military affairs. Small groups of favored war correspondents enjoyed easy access to commanding generals and their field chiefs of staff. Generals Bradley and Patton played unashamedly to a public that knew of them from correspondent reports. Public opinion became a new factor in the general's own power struggle. Quote, at times it constrained at others, it instigated the very tactics of warfare, wrote correspondent Reginald Thompson. Thompson, who was there, says, the most, says that those correspondents close to a general had considerable glamour and consequently an avid readership. They backed their general in his feuds, the quote, Monty versus Bradley, 
end quote, was one of was one was notorious, sometimes with serious results. Quote, the differences between Montgomery and Bradley were exacerbated by correspondence reports, end quote, Thompson has said. Quote, as a result of feeling of unity in the Allied army, which Eisenhower had done so much to protect, was killed in a united effort made impossible, end quote. This breach had its effect on correspondence judgment. Military successes were exaggerated to boost national pride, setbacks minimized to maintain morale. Operation Market Garden, Montgomery's overambitious plan to cross the Rhine, strike into the heart of the Ruhr, and end the war by Christmas is a good example. When the troops of the first British airborne dropped on Arnhem, to seize the bridge there, the British press hailed the operation as an overwhelming success. The BBC described it as, quote, an incredible achievement, certainly one of outstanding operations of the war, end quote. In fact, it was a dreadful muddle, the full extent of which did not emerge until 30 years later, when Cornelius Ryan's book, A Bridge Too Far, provoked a re-examination of what had gone wrong. When the British were forced to retreat with heavy losses, the BBC switched to, quote, a valuable stand by a, quote, depleted, gallant, and undaunted force, end quote. This was true, but it missed the main point that the operation had failed and should never have been undertaken. Correspondent Cyril Ray, who dropped the who dropped on Nijmegen, complained, quote, We tarred up our reverses so historically that it takes an effort to grasp that Arnhem was not merely a British defeat, but a German victory, end quote. Ray did not get a word out, because the British officer in charge of censorship and dispatch stuffed the correspondent's messages into his battle dress blouse and produced them several days later, saying, Terribly sorry, you chaps, but I quite overlooked them. American readers were also in the dark. There were no American correspondents at Arnhem at all. The Americans were equally guilty with their reporting of the German counterattack and the Ardians in December 1944. Everyone had thought that the Germans were finished, and it took until the end of January 1945 before they were finally repulsed. The German advance sent correspondents fleeing to Maastricht, where they tried to send their first stories. The censor quickly pulled them in the line. What they had written, he said, was sheer hysteria, and he told his staff to use blue pencils freely. The correspondents were grateful. Quote, what could have been an unholy mess, end quote, Wesley Gallagher of the Associated Press cabled to his office, was saved by the good sense of the front-line field press censors, end quote. Correspondents now emphasized epics of bravery like the American defense of Boston with its <clears throat> tough commander whose reply of nuts to the German demand for surrender has passed into the American military legend. There was some description of roads choked with burnt out American vehicles and wrecked equipment, but this was attributed to the attempted flight of non-combatant units. The ground troops were fighting huge German Royal Tiger tanks with only rifles and bazookas and were, quote, so filled with remorse and vindictive revenge that they fell upon the enemy with only knives in their hands and tears streaming from their eyes, end quote. It was true that many Americans fought bravely and well, but the Arden story was incomplete without an account of the panic, confusion, and cowardice the German onslaught produced. One American major general, who had never seen action before, had his division taken away from him and died soon afterwards of heart failure. A colonel of... An unarmor of an armored unit handed over to his number two when the attack began and was last seen in a highly nervous state 
hurrying to the rear, quote, for ammunition, unquote. Moves to restore morale were handicapped by the knowledge that, while some American soldiers were fighting for their lives, another 19,000 or so were absent without leave, wandering about in vans, stealing petrol, hijacking food trucks and trains on the way to the front, and making fortunes on the black market. Correspondents wrote nothing about this, and if they had tried, the censors would undoubtedly have killed it. Cyril Ray wrote after the war of a major arrested by the provost marshal of the Sign Base area. Before he was caught, the major general had sent back to the United States uh, $36,000 from black market deals. The provost marshal told Ray, quote, it's just like Chicago in the Al Capone days, end quote. Perhaps the answer to a correspondence dilemma in a war that is basically a just one is not to concern himself with <clears throat> the mainstream of events. Many a Second World War reporter simply opted out. When the war moved on from Paris, it left behind in press quarters and press headquarters at the Hotel Scribe a lot of correspondents who felt that there was nothing to be said for following armies going full tilt through the old battlefields of the First World War, when they could pick up enough stories in Paris just by plucking at the sleeves of soldiers on leave. Occasionally, the military wondered where all the correspondents had gone. At one vital stage of the Battle of Nijmegen, a British officer remembers, quote, there was only one war correspondent president. I asked him which paper he represented and learned that he came from a women's magazine. Heaven knows how he got there. For a certainty, the usual gang of war correspondents we got to know quite well in the campaign were playing poker in Brussels, unquote. According to one of the American public relations officers, correspondents in Brussels were known to take dinner in one of the better restaurants, stroll around the town, return to their deluxe Canterbury Hotel, and begin their stories on the Western Front. Another possibility was to write atmospheric, reflective article that captured the feel of the place and time. If it also conveyed the waste, confusion, and tragic futility of the war, then the result was war reporting like the A.J. AG, Liebling level, achieved by very few, unfortunately. Or a correspondent could deliberately choose an unpopular backwater of the war with the hope that one outstanding story would make weeks or months of waiting worthwhile. Evelyn Irons of the Evening Standard was with the French army. Quote, at this stage, the Allies didn't give a damn about the French, but General de Gaulle was determined to restore some of the lost honor and glory of France. He was absolutely adamant that even though it might have no military value, French troops would cross the Rhine and occupy part of Germany. French troops were terribly ill-equipped, and the Allies wouldn't let them have anything, and in the middle of February, a bitter winter year that year, Half of them were wearing old tennis shoes because there were not enough boots. But de Gaulle had them all lined up, and with a band playing and a tricolor fluttering, he marched them in their tennis shoes across a pontoon and onto German soil. It was probably France's only great moment in the war. End quote. There was a third course open to correspondents, the Ernie Pyle Way. One of the curious facets of reporting of the Second World War was that more, the more the importance of the individual soldier was reduced by technology, the more correspondents concentrated about writing on him. Pyle was the master in this field. He was the antithesis of the Hemingway gung-ho school of war correspondents. A slight gnome-like man, he hated the whole business. He knew nothing of strategy or of military affairs, and so he concentrated on human interest stories. No detail about life for the GI in Europe was too insignificant to report. He once wrote about the color of the soldier's foot ointment. 
No complaint too minor to mention, no message too mundane to relay. His column became the inarticulate G.I.'s letter to folks back home. He was, quote, the G.I.'s friend, end quote, because he made them feel important. He was on their side. Quote, I love the infantry because they are the underdogs. They are the mud, rain, frost, and wind boys. They have no comforts. They even learn to live without the necessities. And in the end, they are the guys the wars can't be won without, end quote. When Pyle took up a GI cause in some 300 daily newspapers and 10,000 weeklies, the military authorities appeared to tremble. On Pyle's demand, all soldiers were allowed to wear stripes on their sleeves for overseas service, and command infantrymen got a $10 a month extra pay. Congress even nicknamed the legislation approving these measures the Ernie Pyle Bill. In fact, the military authorities loved Pyle as much as the GIs did. He was good for morale. General Bradley said, Our soldiers always seemed to fight a little better when Ernie was around. End quote. Various branches of the services competed to have him with them because his fame rubbed off on whomever he joined. The sad thing was that Pyle genuinely did not understand the magnetism he had for soldiers and the emotional responsibility it involved became a burden for him. In August 1944, he had had enough. Quote, if I heard one more shot or saw one more dead man, I'd go off my nut. End quote. So he went back to the United States for a rest. But the military needed him, and he came under heavy official pressure to move to the Pacific Theater. He did not 